heart of where innovation, money, and power collide in Silicon Valley and beyond. This is Bloomberg Technology with Caroline Hyde and Ed Ludlow. I'm Caroline Hyde at Bloomberg's World Headquarters in New York. And I'm Ed Ludlow in San Francisco. This is Bloomberg Technology. Coming up, full coverage of Salesforce's annual Dreamforce conference where, guess what, AI will take center stage. We'll break down what to expect. And we'll go live to Washington as tech leaders descend on Capitol Hill for a meeting with senators to discuss none other than artificial intelligence. More details ahead. And we're going to stay in Washington to get the latest from Google's antitrust trial and break down the biggest takeaways from Apple's Wanderlust event and the continued China concerns. All that and as always so much more ahead including just a quick check on these markets. We go macro for a moment because look we're actually getting a bit of a bid into US benchmarks at least the Nasdaq up some four tenths percent off of its highs but nevertheless managing to shake off some of the anxiety that we saw in European trading where the European benchmarks to the, to the downside. UK really showing signs of concern in the slowdown from the economy. We're also worried about Germany. We're worried about of course what the ECB signals tomorrow. We're seeing the MSCI all country world index just up about a tenth of a percent therefore as it's dragged off of its highs from the US and two year yield we're actually dipping a little bit. The CPI print was the all important number for US today and that core CPI is still running hot hotter than the Fed would like. So could we still see some hikes coming November or December. But for now it's enough to think that the pause is on track for this month and the two year yield actually just getting a little bit of a bid but we're about five percent. But Ed I want to quickly dive into what's happening in the world of crypto. We're managing to sustain above that twenty five thousand level that we dipped below in the last couple of trading days. Volatility still there but with a slightly weaker dollar we're up just about six tenths of a percent. But dig into the micro moves today. Yeah, it's a jam packed Wednesday and a mixed picture. The first name that I'm looking at is Apple. Softer by three tenths of one percent. Remember, we fell one point seven percent in Tuesday session after we got the iPhone 15 and Pro and Pro Max generations. We're going to dig into that later in the show with Mark Gurman. But we have heard from the Chinese government about media reports on them restricting use of iPhone in government agencies and state backed enterprises. But they also said and, and, and kind of reiterated that they haven't got any edict or legislation that bans uh, foreign handsets. That kind of muddied the waters. We're going to have to explain that one. Still moving to the downside. That's common after an iPhone sales event. In the kind of software SaaS enterprise space, the two key names that we're watching, principally as the leads of this show, Oracle rebounding up 1.9 percent coming off Tuesday where it fell by the most since 2002 on slowing cloud sales. We're going to get into that with an analyst voice very shortly. And then, as you said, Caro, right now here in San Francisco, Dreamforce underway. The story for Salesforce has been about integrating AI into their existing CRM and other offerings. For more on Dreamforce, who else? Bloomberg's Brody Ford is in town, in the flesh. Brody Ford, what's going on at Dreamforce? Yeah, I mean, it is back. Uh, Dreamforce, 40K people here in downtown San Francisco. I am one of them. And the big thing for them, like every other company, is AI. And the subtext here is that Salesforce has been grappling with, uh, they were growing above 20% every year, and now it's come to slow down. And there's a bit of anxiety among the investor community. But of course, AI looks like this beautiful accelerant to bring them <laughs> back up. Um, and their pitch is like a lot of the incumbent players that, yeah, sure, you can get your data and plug it into these LLMs, but, you know, can you trust that? Yeah. Through our platform, you can trust the use of the AI. That's their pitch. I mean, we get the Einstein, or Einstein indeed, upgrades, and, and it's sort of being injected across the entire offering of Salesforce, Brody. And you can see, therefore, the nuance. Come with us. It's safe. But this comes in a context of... Well, anxiety across investors post Oracle's numbers, the fact that maybe all this talk of AI all this desire to have AI doesn't always immediately mean revenue picks up in quite the way we were anticipating. How do you think Salesforce navigates that one? Salesforce has been pretty intentional about communicating it's going to get what the pricing is going to look like. And it's also it's really not that hypothetical what a lot of their AI use cases are right. You're selling software for salespeople. If you can automatically draft some outreach emails, I mean, as a journalist, I would use that for sure, right? So I think a lot of their use cases are going to be a lot more immediate than some of the other AI we hear about, meaning, as you say, quicker revenue uplift. 
love that context for us. In journalists and across any industry group, of course, Brody Ford, we thank you so much for it. Have fun out there as people get back together in the flesh. But meanwhile, well, let's stay virtual for a moment and get to Gil Luria, who's DA Davidson, Managing Director and Head of Institutional Research, who I know is keeping a keen eye on all of the announcements coming out of Salesforce and Mark Benioff, really talking about why you would want to be with their AI offering. Is this a very crowded space? Are there some significant winners clearly pulling ahead in this? Gil, can you hear me? Well, our pr perspective is that AI artificial intelligence is going to... Yes. Um, our perspective is that artificial intelligence uh, is going to transform a lot of software business, if not all software we're business and technology businesses, but it's going to take a while. There's going to be very few companies that benefit in the short term. It's really it, NVIDIA and Microsoft have a very clear story of how their businesses are going to get transformed and accelerate in the short term. For everybody else, they have to build AI products. They have to get better at AI. Their customers want that. Their customers expect that, but it's going to take a while. And their customers, for as much as they're asking for it, are also skeptical of products that have been rushed to market. And they're going to be patient about making investments in AI. They're going to want to see mature, ready-for-market products before they implement them in their business. Gil, I know you have folks from your desk on the ground at Dreamforce. You're keeping a close eye on what's going on. Does anything of substance actually come out of Dreamforce in terms of what you then pass on to institutional investors about what you learned? Well, they are very good about relaying the product roadmap and how they're going to incorporate artificial intelligence uh, into products like Tableau, like MuleSoft, like the core uh, sales and marketing offerings, how they're going to do it holistically, how they're going to protect the, cons the customer's data. This is what their customers want to hear. It doesn't mean their customers are ready to push the button and buy new software but they want to hear that this is on the roadmap. They want to hear that it's going to be part of the product set going forward. And maybe they'll push the button next year or the year after that. So it's critical that Salesforce presents a good vision. And it sounds like they are. So, Gil, the story of Salesforce has been top line growth above 25%, 2019, 2020. When I posed to an investor the other day that AI could return Salesforce's growth to that level, he just laughed and just gave an audible hat. Uh, where do you see AI taking this company? Yeah, I, I think the burden of proof is on Salesforce and again on every other software company that's talking AI right now. Salesforce's revenue growth right now is barely double digits and they really have to come up with a new set of very compelling products for that to accelerate. Either that or enterprise software spend has to pick up and we're not seeing that yet either. So just like a lot of other software companies, and we'll talk about Oracle in a second, AI is a big part of what they have to do. It doesn't mean that it's driving revenue acceleration anytime soon. Yeah, I think, Caroline, for that reason, that is why we're thinking about Oracle, right? Yeah. Because the implications for that name are the same for Salesforce as well, Caroline. Yeah, and, and give us that sense of, well, whether you were as shocked as the rest of the market, Gil. I mean, the fact that we saw Oracle shares tumble the most since 2002, even while posting 30% levels of growth for cloud when it comes to cloud AI offerings, it feels as though that just cannot live up to the insatiable expectations of investors right now. Oracle is still a single digit grower. It was masked over the last 12 months by the Cerner acquisition and, and they are growing the OCI cloud hosting business very rapidly, but it's still a relatively small business for them. And most of their other businesses are either flat, declining, or growing very slowly. Mm. They set expectations that AI. I th yeah, Cara, I'm going to jump. I'm going to jump in here, Gil. I think we have some technical issues, but we really appreciate your analysis of both companies, Salesforce and Oracle. That was Gil Luria of DA Davidson up in Portland, Oregon. Thank you very much. Right, coming up here on Bloomberg Technology, Apple's latest iPhones. We're going to recap the Apple launch event. Wow, what an event it was. And dive in on what the company's doing to lure back consumers in what is, frankly, a sluggish smartphone market globally. This is Bloomberg Technology.
Since the very first iPhone, we focused on giving our users a device that's incredibly powerful, remarkably easy to use, and beautifully designed. Every year, we built on this foundation to create experiences that make a real difference in our users' daily lives. Today, we're pushing what users love about iPhone even further. iPhone 15 Pro 6.1 inch screen $999, iPhone 15 Pro Max 6.7 inch screen $1199 with the starting version 256 gigabytes of memory. When you hold both handsets in your hand what jumps out will turn them on their end and you'll see the USB-C uh, connector or port ending almost 12 years of lightning connector which Apple introduced in 2012. By the way, goodbye ringer mute switch button thing, hello action button. Then you look around the edges and the sides and it's those titanium sides that are new to the iPhone 15 Pro and Pro Max generation. The colors are interesting, more kind of limited options on the color side for Pro and Pro Max. Compare with 15 and 15 Plus where you get these kind of brighter pastel colors. And then for Pro and Pro Max, it's really what is on the inside. The A17 processor, Apple's fastest ever smartphone chip, brings much speed but also more memory um, and, and higher performance. And for Pro Max in particular, new camera technology, up to 5x zoom uh, or magnification, which is kind of pushing things forward on the photo side for iPhone. So you see Tim Cook there, Carrie, taking selfies with the crowd, and it was so one? packed Did in there. Did you get one? Did you get one? Honestly, the the wait was hours, <laughs> and I had bigger things to report on. I wanted yeah. to get hands on with the phones, but just take my word for it. If there were a thousand people in the room, ninety percent of them were just going, "Oh, USB C on the bottom." That's the reality <laughs> of it. We can be quite basic sometimes, can't we, Ed? It all comes down yeah. to charging. <laughs> Yeah, and look, this was European Union mandated. It had a deadline in 2024. Apple sort of jumped before they were pushed on it. But it brings that device in line with other Apple devices and every other product that's out there from other brands. Oh. Um, so I thought that was really important. By the way, which color would you go for? Of what you just saw, what was your favorite? I mean, anything goldy looking chain I'm into. The only issue being I then have to get some enormous black plastic contraption to go over the top so I don't hurt it. So kind of and I'm color we... agnostic nowadays. <laughs> And as we know, no more leather in Apple accessories. And on gold, I'm going to ask Mark Gurman about that in just a moment. So let's bring him in. Bloomberg's Mark Gurman to recap the day that was in the Apple event. I mean, Mark, the emphasis from the street, at least, has been the pricing of iPhone 15 Pro Max. They raised the price by $100. What technology do you get in return? So the price increase is really interesting because they went as minor and stealth as they could on this price increase. What they've done is they've eliminated the 128 gigabyte capacity option for the Pro Max, starting at that 256 gigabyte. So they didn't raise the price of that storage tier, but they raised the price of the phone by removing that entry level tier. So about a 9% uh, price increase uh, in the US, but you're having more sizable price increases elsewhere. There's a minor price jump uh, in China. There's a 14% price increase on the Pro models in India, in Canada, you have a 50 Canadian dollar increase on the regular Pro and a $200 Canadian dollar increase uh, on the Pro Max. Uh, the differences this year between the Pro and the Pro Max are broader than ever. Before, it just was battery life and screen size. Now you're getting that periscope camera. That gives you that 5X zoom uh, on the optical side. So hardware zoom 5X, which means no degradation and then 25X zoom on the digital side. So the quality will dip a little bit, but you have that really intense 25X zoom. So it's an interesting strategy, but I do think that camera will come to the, to the lower end model next year. And the strategy is so necessary because we know the context with which Apple not only puts its new phones into the market where we're worried about the Chinese consumer, but also more broadly, revenue has been on the downside. iPhone is still so integral. Is is it obvious to you that this is going to be a hot seller as we head towards holidays? You know, I'll tell you, I've had some time to digest the announcements. I would say that these are pretty minor uh, refreshes overall, but there is a new casing on the iPhone 15 Pro and Pro Max, right? That titanium and what I think consumers uh, that are jumping for iPhones, those early adopters, but those big Apple fans, they want to buy what looks new. And these new phones look new, so they're going to buy them, right? But the technology itself, the, the feature set, 
it's not going to feel much different. It's not going to operate much different than the year prior. If you have a 14 Pro, you probably don't need to update to a 15 Pro. Uh, this is going to bring in people who are on 13s, 12s, 11s, and earlier. Uh, but I certainly think, despite that, that new design is going to do enough, and they are going to get done what they need to get done, and that is to probably meet their sales expectations uh, for the holiday quarter. And titanium, you can see why their marketing is all in, in titanium, because that's really what they got this year. Mark, we got the investor's perspective uh, on Bloomberg Television earlier today. Encore Crawford, who's a, a portfolio manager at Alger, just have a listen to what she had to say. 40% of Apple's earnings comes from their services revenue. And that services revenue is almost utility-like in nature. It's the storage that you pay on your iPhone, um, which, you know, we're only increasing the amount of storage and the number of photos that we have in the cloud. And so there is almost a, a stability aspect to the stock, although, granted, I, I, do, I do worry that the handset numbers are going to come under pressure, not only in China, but also in the U.S. Uh, Mark, China is a concern. Timing is everything. We heard from the Chinese government overnight about the reports of clamping down on foreign handsets. What do we know? What is the latest? Yeah, two things. Um, I'd argue on that first point, uh, services are not 40% of Apple's overall revenue. If that was the case, we would be having a much different discussion. It's about 20%. Uh, but I will note that they did announce new iCloud storage tiers going from a $10 maximum at 2 terabytes to a $60 a month maximum at 12 terabytes. Uh, I'd be shocked if anyone could fill up 12 terabytes in two and a half lifetimes, but certainly those options are there. Uh, in terms of the China situation, it seems like they're doing two things. They seem to be walking back uh, some of these uh, claims and reports by saying there has not been a ban. Uh, just because China is saying that doesn't mean it to be true. Uh, I definitely you know, still believe that government agencies are pushing their employees and their workers to not bring iPhones into work. Uh, but you know, publicly, they are walking that notion back. Uh, and privately, um, they are probably still discussing you know, the future. Uh, of Apple and that relationship there. Uh, in terms of the other claims they said, they said they've seen security issues uh, on iPhones. I personally think they're referring to some of the reports you've seen around iPhone security up in recent weeks. Always bringing us the full picture, Mark Gurman, going international when it comes to Apple. We thank you so much. I mean, let's talk about what's coming up as well, because we're not just talking about hardware and services. We're, we're thinking about what goes on inside the world of technology right now and how it affects the way you work. Work shifting is upon us. The CEO of GitHub. Well, we're going to be thinking about all the artificial intelligence viewpoints there. This is Bloomberg Technology. I'm now for work shifting, where we look at the changing landscape of the labor market amid advances in technology. If you're a developer, it's changing fast. GitHub's AI coding assistant, Copilot, for example, has tens of thousands of enterprise customers and millions of users getting excited about it. Here to explain how it's actually boosting productivity in the here and the now. Thomas Domke, he's GitHub CEO. It's great to have you in the studio, Thomas. And, and what I'd love a sense of is how much we're seeing a speed up, how much productivity, and how you measure that at the moment. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. Really exciting times. You know, every company now is a software company. It's not only the big tech, you know, on the West Coast. It's really every bank, every supermarket, every automaker. They all have to write software. So they employ software developers. And what they do is, you know, they're, they're writing code on their machines. And GitHub Copilot predicts that next word, the next line, even, even multiple lines of code. And so in the last two years since we launched GitHub Copilot, we saw that half the code is written by Copilot in those files as enabled. And it increases productivity of up to 50 55%. And so we're seeing like the first real use case for AI where a whole sector of the workforce is adopting us to grow productivity. What's so fascinating is, of course, you're within the Microsoft uh, overall yeah. family. So OpenAI has got this relationship. There's also OpenAI Code Interpreter. You've also then got some open source applications sort of coming to the pipeline. We're looking at some exuberance, it feels like, in the developer world for Open Interpreter. Where do you go? Open source, not open source, open AI, GitHub, open interpreter. What are the offerings here? I mean, all of, all of those will be probably covered and, and cover different use cases. The open AI code interpreter really helps you with analyzing data. It's, it's really for the Microsoft Excel user to, to process some data and, 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 and 
draw charts and, and those kind of things. With, with Copilot and at GitHub, and, and quite frankly, at Microsoft, we've always been a developer tools company. Mm. Microsoft's first ever product was uh, Altair Basic, you know, Basic Interpreter, uh, almost, 40, almost 50 years ago, 48 years ago. And so with GitHub, we're going where the developer is. They're in, they're in the editor, they're writing code, they're debugging code, they have to, you know, understand code that comes as far back from the 60s, a programming language called COBOL, all the way to you know, the modern stack, the cloud native companies um, that, that built you know, the, the e-commerce world of today. All of them use code to build their innovation. Thomas, how big a player or contributor is GitHub in the open source AI movement? Do you consider GitHub a leader there? GitHub is the home of, of all open source. You know, many, if not, if not the most, um, um, the majority of open source projects is hosted on, on GitHub. And as such, you know, many of those new AI projects are also hosted on GitHub. And, and GitHub is supporting them by providing them free hosting for their source code, you know, for their project, for their issue tracking, for discussions. And of course, we're enabling them to use GitHub Copilot uh, to build their AI innovation. Thomas, I speak to all kinds of founders, software engineers about Copilot. Are you able to tell me what specific coding projects are happening with Copilot? And do you track them? Do you have the data that can tell you the specific areas of focus? So we don't track, you know, at, at the large scale of, of what project that would be a, a violation of our privacy principles. But for individual organizations, uh, we can show them the data in which repositories, in which projects uh, they are most successful with the use of Copilot. You know, there are certain programming languages like Python or JavaScript that, that see really strong benefits from, from the use of Copilot and a lot of uh, lines of code written uh, for these projects. Meanwhile. Yeah. Boss of Microsoft, Satya Nadella, is in Washington, along with an awful lot yeah. of other key leaders thinking about the future of regulation when it comes to artificial intelligence. Are you positive and feeling that that's going to be written well for GitHub to continue to see this evolution on your own platforms? It's great that these conversations are happening, and we really need to have these conversations happening in Washington because we need the regulation happening fast. Right? We need the legal um, security, the legal safety to apply these tools and get the productivity gains. And think about like many companies now have software developers spread all around the whole world. You know, they're sitting here in the United States, they're sitting in Germany, in India, in Australia. And so we also need to have regulation that is somewhat equal across these countries because otherwise, as a software developer myself, as the manager of, you know, thousands of software uh, developers. I don't want my software developers in the United States to have a different productivity gain than those that sit in Germany and, and, and those that sit in India, right? We don't, we want a balance across all these countries, not, not a competition between these countries. Fascinating. Thomas Domke of GitHub, we thank you. Welcome back to Bloomberg Technology. I'm Caroline Hyde in New York. And I'm Ed Ludlow in San Francisco. Caro, a quick check in on the markets. The NASDAQ 100, this tech heavy index, it's been a choppy week of trading up Monday, down Tuesday, and now we're up Wednesday modestly. CPI data a little hotter than expected. We ask questions, therefore, about what the Federal Reserve does in the rest of the year. Do they raise rates one more time again and when? Why do we care? Because higher rates impact the present cash uh, values of future cash flows for tech companies, particularly on the Nasdaq 100. You have lots of software names trading at higher multiples. That's what we care about. In terms of specific movers, we're watching a lot of the leaders in the artificial intelligence space. Some names behind me, all of them moving to the upside. Microsoft up one point cent, a big point a booster on the Nasdaq 100, Palantir and Meta. What all three stocks have in common is that their CEOs are all in one place right now in a very important meeting. That is one of our top stories. More than 20 tech and civil society leaders are currently taking part in a closed-door Senate meeting to talk about how to shape AI regulation. Heavy hitters like Elon Musk, Sam Altman and Sundar Pichai are present. We caught up with Senator Elizabeth Warren and got her take and talked about Musk. They're sitting at a big round table all by themselves. All of the senators are to sit there and ask no questions. That's the setup. For more, let's bring in Bloomberg's Anna Edgerton on the ground in D.C. What's going on inside that room, Anna? 
Well, I'm speaking with several people who are actually in the room with the CEOs, and they're saying that right now there's a discussion going on about open source and the security of sharing open source resource research. You have people like Clement DeLong of Humming, Hugging Face and um, and others who are saying that open source is good and important for innovation. You have others like Mark Zuckerberg who is saying that it pre presents a security risk. So there have already been some interesting exchanges, and we'll see how the rest of the session develops this afternoon as they go into more conversation. How fascinating. Let's just go. We have, of course, Elon Musk coming live to us, we understand. Let's just dip in for a second. Um, I think the, the, the general, I think it's clear that there's a strong consensus, a warming, a warming consensus that there should be some AI regulation, okay. that it would be in the best interest of the, the people to do so. And, and I think we'll probably see something happen. I don't know what, on what time frame um, or how, exactly how it will manifest itself. Yeah, that's but, the question. What were they going to do? I, I don't know. I mean, there's, there's, there's clearly, we've created regulatory agencies before. Um, and um, actually, just recently, I just, just before leaving, made the point that um, you know, while our regulatory agencies are not perfect, um, and I deal with regulators on a very frequent basis, um, with uh, automotive, um, you know, communications, Starlink, um, and then uh, FAA with, with rockets. So I've had a uh, tremendous amount of interaction with regulators for you know, a couple of decades at least. Um, and while regulators are not perfect, I, I, there's no regulatory agency that I'm aware of that I, would, I think we should, at the federal level at least, that, that we should delete. Yeah. Um, Do you so think I, there should be a so I, so I think AI I can, or something like that? Yeah, yeah, I don't know what exactly. <laughs> perhaps, perhaps the Department of AI. Um, the probably, listen, I think the probability of there being some sort of AI regulatory agency that stands on its own, similar to the FAA or FCC, is likely at some point. You think so? I think so. Um, now, the, the, the reason that I've been such an advocate for uh, AI safety in advance of sort of anything terrible happening is that I think the consequences of AI going wrong are, are severe. Um, so we have to be proactive rather than reactive. Uh, you know, in the past, if you, if you take, say, and I, I, I'm being somewhat late for speaking of regulators, I'm a little late for the FAA, I'm meeting with the FAA. We don't hold you up. <laughs> sure, but, um, yeah, if you take the example of, of say, seatbelts, seatbelts um, were opposed by the auto industry for a very long time, even though the data was very clear that they're safe, uh, that they, they radically improve uh, uh, deaths and injuries. Um, so, you know, we, we don't want to be in that situation where we're fighting regulations, even though, you know, there's a safety thing. I mean, we can't wait for millions of people to die in auto accidents, as, you know. Like, and it's important to just elevate the question here. The question is, is, is really one of civilizational risk. So just it's, it's not like one group versus another, one group of humans versus another. It's like, hey, this is something that's potentially risky for all humans everywhere. Very important to, to, to understand that. Is there an equivalent of this? Do you think Congress is sufficiently ready to regulate AI? No, no, not yet. No, the, 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 the sequence of events will not be um, jumping in at the deep end and, and making rules. But, but the, it, it starts with, an, with insight. Um, in fact, this is actually how all of the regulatory bodies have been formed, I believe, uh, is you start with a group formed to create insight, to understand the situation. Uh, then you have proposed rulemaking. Um, you'll get some objections from industry or whatever. Um, and then ultimately, you, you, you get sort of a consensus on rulemaking. That rulemaking then becomes uh, law or regulation. What's the well, question? Yes. I saw very little there you have it, you know, Musk speaking to reporters, of course, it seems to be as they draw to a close for the lunchtime break, Anna, and we understand that some people are going to be subbing in for the CEOs of their companies for the second half of the discussions with senators. And more broadly, we heard from Elon Musk there really talking about whether or not we will see some sort of regulator start to oversee artificial intelligence. Just tell us if you can summarize the arguments we've heard thus far of how you really get to grips with art regulating AI more broadly. I mean, that's the question. I think you have most of the people in that room agreeing that there should be some kind of regulation, but there's not agreement about how. And when it comes to like a licensing uh, regime or a regulatory agency like Musk was just talking about, we know that other companies like IBM actually pro oppose that proposal, whereas you know others like Microsoft and OpenAI think that would be a good idea. So we'll see more policy discussion about that as we go into the afternoon. And the interesting thing about Musk, in his opening statement, he tried to make the point that the AI that 
power self-driving cars is not as dangerous as the kind of deep mind AI that emulates human intelligence. However, he did get some pushback on that from Deb Raji, one of the researchers from Berkeley, who made the point that self-driving car-powered AI could also make mistakes that could prove to be fatal. Well said. Anna Edgerton getting all the inside track in the closed door meeting and us bringing you what was happening just on the outside of that with Elon Musk as well. Let's continue this conversation. I'm pleased to say Dominique Shelton in Leipzig is with us. She's privacy and cybersecurity partner at Mayor Brown. Leads the firm's global data innovation team, offering CEO and broad level advice basically on exactly this, on the impact of artificial intelligence and how it should be adopted without some sort of a regulatory framework. Are you positive that we will get a regulator or will it be down to self-regulation once more? You know, uh, thank you so much, Caroline, uh, for having me, and Ed, thank you also. This is such an important issue, and um, just hearing what uh, uh, CEO Musk was talking about, how AI is really going to impact all of our lives, medical, financial, educational. So this conversation that's happening uh, with the senators is so important. Uh, we are going to see regulation. The only question will be whether the United States moves first. Uh, what we've got uh, very, we're very close to right now is uh, legislation being uh, adopted in Europe mm. uh, to govern AI, uh, and we're expecting that by December 2023. So uh, the issue is there are 37 countries and six continents that have draft legislation already before their legislatures, and uh, Europe looks like it'll go first uh, with the the US behind. And EU sort of shifted tone. Originally it felt as though they were going to be regulating the application of AI, but then suddenly it turned its attention more to the actual building of the foundational models. That seems to be an argument being pushed back against at least some US CEOs. They don't want to see the building of foundational models being under some sort of scope here. Is that already thrown out with a bathwater? I think this is going to be an ongoing debate uh, and, and there's a discussion at the U.S. level and also the international level about having the actual um, deployers, the users of the AI having uh, guardrails as well as the uh, providers and, uh, the, and, and the foundation models as well, the generative AI, large language models. So I think we're starting to see proposals like the one that came out yesterday um, with uh, Senator uh, Blumenthal and Hawley. They have a framework that would encompass the large language models as well as uh, the uh, other types of AI. Dominique, when Elon Musk was speaking just a few moments ago, he gave the analogy of acting on AI safety as being akin to the seatbelt, that with the seatbelt, action came after many tragedies and crashes, and he just wants to be proactive rather than reactive. Is that an approach that you think will work based on what DC is saying right now? Yes, I think it's very exciting to see this number of CEOs. We have uh, literally the the most important and largest tech companies that are present in D.C. right now to discuss this issue because they do see it as being important and they are being proactive. I think it's wonderful that the academics are there as well and the community groups are uh, uh, present at uh, Senator Schumer's forum because the point is that we all need to grapple with these issues together. Uh, there is going to need to be a communication from a proactive steps taken by the uh, leadership of our tech companies, and they're doing that just by their presence of uh, being present to have these very important discussions. So I'm excited for the future. Dominique, do you get the sense that policymakers, legislators, are as collaborative on this issue as the private sector is? Are they actually engaging on it with those that are leading the development of the technology? Yes, what I'm seeing is cross-party in the U.S., cross-party and bipartisan support around uh, answering the call of many of these CEOs to, to put in place uh, the opportunities and governance and guardrails that will al allow AI to be just amazing. So what we want is uh, the, the ability to innovate and create understanding where there are uh, limits or areas where safety uh, needs to come first. And this is something that uh, the regulators and the business community are aligning on. I also will say what's good this time is that there is also uh, the, the use of uh, research scientists, large language model experts to engage them on how this technology actually works and therefore how we can craft uh, common sense legislation. 
What isn't being talked about? What's not being talked about are the nitty gritty of, of uh, the sort of unanimity of thinking around the world in terms of what the legislation should look like. What we're seeing all around the world is a focus on ranking, risk ranking of AI, a focus on high risk, treating that differently than we're treating low risk AI. There's also a focus on testing and monitoring and auditing of the systems themselves to make sure that they are amazing and they're doing exactly what the companies want them to do and what the public wants. And so I th I'm very excited for uh, the way the legislation, the draft legislation has been uh, put together and the framework that uh, has been floated in, Was frameworks being floated in Washington as well as around the world because we're getting at tackling the actual uh, governance that will make AI amazing. Uh, Dominique, Caroline and I speak to companies and executives of all shapes and sizes and sectors, and they're talking the talk, and it's really hard for us to discern if they're walking the walk. Do you see clients actually spending money and hiring the right people to operationalize any of what we've just discussed? Absolutely. You know, what has been so exciting and what we've seen, we have an AI task force that we uh, put together at our firm because it's a cross-disciplinary issue. And we, every day I'm speaking to clients that are from uh, Fortune 500 companies that are very serious about getting AI governance right. They are already looking at draft legislation and mapping to that now so that they are uh, prepared and ready to pivot when final regulations come in, they're going to be uh, already ahead of the game. That's the way to approach this because, uh, as uh, Mr. Musk said earlier, uh, regulation is going to come. And so the key here is really being prepared. And we're seeing clients and companies every day. I talk to clients and companies that are uh, focused, laser, laser focused on getting this right and being amazing with their AI. And global regulation at that. Good to have a global law firm with us. We thank you so much, of course, Dominique. Coming thank into you. the studio, Dominique Shelton, Leipzig, partner over at Mayor Brown. Ed. All right, let's get some talking tech. And first up, Arm is expecting to price its initial public offering at the top end of its range or even higher. Bloomberg sources say that the SoftBank owned chip designer could be a dollar or more above its $51 target. Arm set to begin trading on the NASDAQ tomorrow. And game maker Square Enix is hoping to rebound from the underwhelming sales of Final Fantasy XVI, the latest installment of its global hit series. New, nearly $2 billion sorry, of its value has fallen since the game's release. Now investors are wondering if the legacy franchise has run its course. Plus, the CEO of Binance US has left the company. Brian Schroeder stepped down from his role just as the struggling crypto platform conducted its second round of layoffs. More than 100 jobs have been cut from its workforce amid a regulatory crackdown from the US Securities and Exchange Commission. Caroline. Meanwhile, look, let's talk about what else is happening over in Washington. A 10-week antitrust trial between Google and the Department of Justice is underway. And the government is accusing the search giant, of course, of spending well, $10 billion a year to maintain what it calls as a monopoly. With us is going to be really a moment to dissect how we're hearing the arguments laid out, Ed. We ultimately know that it feels as though we're trying to reminisce to a 1990s feel of Microsoft. How much is this the time that we're going to see ultimately Alphabet be able to fight back on the grounds that, yes, it is actually easy to be able to change your ways in which you search. The point is that they're so good, no one wants to do that, Ed. Yeah, and what I would say is the reason we love hearings and court documents is sometimes you get crazy stories, like what Google was doing 20 years ago to fight off its competition. Let's bring in Bloomberg's Nia Lylan out in D.C. on the antitrust beat. And that was kind of a mainstay of your latest reporting, Leah. What was going on inside Google 2003 and what the Justice Department kind of unearthed in those disclosures? What have we learned? Yeah, so the very first witness who started last uh, yesterday afternoon is uh, Hal Varian. He is Google's longtime chief economist, and he was sort of the one who came up with this uh, strategy that they ended up pursuing to make Google's search engine the default um, across browsers and mobile devices. It, it sort of came out of these memos that he wrote in 2003-2005 uh, timeframe when they sort of discovered that if people had set Google as their homepage, they ended up doing a lot more searching than if they had uh, their homepage as something else, like Yahoo, AOL, MSN, some of the, the other big web pages of the day. So that sort of made them realize that when you make it really easy for people to 
do it, make it automatic, it, it ends up leading to much more traffic and making it, uh, you know, Google uh, a much better product. So Hal Varian, he's been called, I understand, of course, to testify. That was one of the first moves made. Are we likely to see this momentum build in terms of the argument of how long Google's been aware of how important it is to dominate the world of search and ultimately whether it will ever bring about some sort of breakup? Yeah, so as um, you know, we were saying, this is a 10-week trial. So there's going to be a lot of different uh, witnesses, both within Google and from outside Google, uh, talking about how its power and search has sort of grown over time. You know, Hal Varian is the person that they sort of decided to start with as sort of like the origin story of, of this, um, this conduct as the Justice Department uh, alleges. But we're also going to hear from uh, a lot of other interesting people, including some of the people who helped uh, develop search, some of uh, Google's search rivals, um, like folks at DuckDuckGo and Microsoft and uh, the now defunct Neva. And we'll also hear from uh, uh, Sundar Pichai himself, who is now the CEO, but um, you know has actually already come up in some of these emails and such because back in the early days he was very involved in helping develop the search engine. Bloomberg's Leah Nyland, that on the ground antitrust reporting from DC. Thank you. Let's keep the conversation going. Joining us now, William Kovacic, GW Professor of Law, and, and William, you know the trials are exciting. They give news flow. They give new disclosures. But the, the, the only question is, is this a serious threat to Google as a whole entity? Uh, it is a serious threat. Uh, and the threat goes back to the experience with the Microsoft case, which the Department of Justice brought over 20 years ago. And the most important concept to come out of that case is that there are important limits on what a dominant enterprise can do by way of buying up inputs, channels of distribution, that it and its rivals need in order to compete. And the theory that was endorsed by the Court of Appeals in that case is that a dominant firm can overreach when it basically seeks to preclude its competitors from getting effective access to users. And that core theory is the heart of this case. And I'm sure that's the theory that Google takes most seriously here in its defense. William, you spent almost a decade as a non-executive director at the UK CMA, Competition and Markets Authority. Put your regulator hat on and tell us what chances you think US regulators have of doing of, of a successful action against Google or Alphabet. They have a fighting chance to demonstrate that there was an infringement of the law uh, because of this core concept that is favorable to them. Uh, obtaining uh, relief that goes beyond prohibiting the specific conduct uh, might be difficult. That's proven to be a very tough challenge in the United States. Uh, the other thing that will be difficult to cope with in the case itself is, is Google's response. Uh, in talking about the placement of the search engine on these devices, I suspect Google is going to ask the court, what would you have expected us to do otherwise? Uh, should we have stood by and not even bid in the auctions that determined who was going to be on those devices. Should we have simply allowed our rivals to go ahead and obtain that precious real estate? Uh, what would you have had us do otherwise? And by implication, what should large firms do otherwise? I think that's going to be a hard, hard issue for the court to wrestle with. But I'd say if I had to look at uh, where the, the possibilities for success are, uh, the government has a serious prospect of succeeding on the essential question of whether uh, exclusivity was yeah. improperly obtained as a means of exclusion. We had Rebecca Allensworth on yesterday and thinking about sort of the concept of ultimately, even if they win or lose this individual case, ultimately the pendulum is swinging in the way in which regulators look at big tech. You yourself at the FTC chairing it, of course, the agency from March 2008, 2009. Do you think conversations are permanently changed in the way in which regulators eye big tech? I think there's been a durable change in the risk appetite uh, that regulators in the United States, in the United Kingdom, as we were just mentioning before, take in looking at the sector. I think there was a fairly strong belief 20 years ago, going back to the documents that Leah was describing earlier, uh, there was a sense that this is a very dynamic sector and that unpredictable changes, changes you can't even identify at the moment, 
will deny any individual firm uh, sustained preeminence in the mm -hmm. field. Uh, those assumptions have been revisited, and I think globally, uh, you see a change from thinking, be cautious about intervening, to be willing to intervene, even though the specific outcome might be uncertain. And, and part of that strong belief is that simply having an active presence of the regulators uh, chastens and limits uh, the behavior of dominant firms. And isn't it ironic that ultimately that moment, that unpredictable moment, is upon us? The fact that generative AI has swung into the mix and suddenly seems to be the most competitive threat to Google search that we've had in a long time. So I'm interested as to the perspective that already in practice do you think companies have been withholding from making purchases, withholding from perhaps making changes to the way in which they react to competitors because of the way regulators are now acting? I think we're going to get some good insights in the trial on exactly that question. But I suspect that what companies have continued to look for are opportunities to achieve real breakthroughs of the kind that you were discussing in the previous segment with the Musk interview. Uh, I think there's no question that companies are looking for opportunities that will astonish by allowing them to achieve true preeminence on their, in their own right. But, but a, a very difficult and almost unmeasurable issue in the trial is whether you advance innovation more by being aggressive in intervening or whether you advance it more by being more permissive. Absolutely fascinating, Professor. We thank you, GW Professor of Law, William Kovacic. Thank you. Meanwhile, coming up, a cyber attack takes out part of the Vegas Strip as hackers target MGM. We'll have the details next. This is Bloomberg Technology. MGM Resorts in Las Vegas. It was hit by a cyber attack this week, taking down payment systems, slot machines, guests' ability to actually access their hotel rooms and check in. Details of the attack, including who was behind it, though, the motive, the type of information that they may have obtained, all remains pretty limited. A spokesperson for the FBI office in Las Vegas said they are aware of the attack, they are assisting, and MGM says its hotels and casinos are currently operational. But, Ed, plenty of frustration there, it feels. Yeah, some of the reporting is amazing. People being forced to use cash. Can you imagine having to use paper money in this day and age? <laughs> Outrageous. But check out that story on Bloomberg.com because sadly, Caroline, that does it for this edition of Bloomberg Technologies. Big show. Recap it on our podcast wherever you find your podcasts on the Bloomberg Terminal. But we're also on Apple, Spotify and on iHeart as well as the Bloomberg platforms from San Francisco and out in New York City. This is Bloomberg Technology.